Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, meeting of the uh, Fire Authority. Um, before I start, um, members who were at the Managing Committee, perhaps even all the governors, would have noticed that there weren't any, any microphones here anymore. And it, it is important to point out that the um, a new microsoft system allows you obviously to you know to speak without having to switch on buttons and things. But the one thing I need to point out before we start the meeting, the, the microphones are very sensitive uh, and that uh, it picks up conversations and other, uh, let's just to say even probably people eating uh, on the mic. And obviously this, this meeting is being recorded. And we apply on the website, so we, you know, we avoid people's embarrassment of having them munching away or saying things they shouldn't do, which occasionally happens in political meetings. Um, just to be aware of that before we. Um, and this is an improvement. <laughs> well, it, it, it's much better actually just being able to speak without switching buttons on and off. It's very sensitive, and I think perhaps the managing committee, they, you know, we, we were testing it and. You know, Whoever was monitoring it, so it is sensitive. So, just wanted to give you a sort of um, well, it's good news we've got the new microphone system, but just a slight warning about that before we kick off tonight's uh, meeting. So, have we got any apologies for absence, Fanny? Yes, Chair, I've received apologies from Councillors Dave McElroy and Dexter Smith, and Councillor Grace Boyle is attending via Teams. That's great. Is, 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 can we see? Seen her on the screen, or is she? She, she didn't. She didn't want to be. She, okay. Oh, she's. That, that's fine. No, because if she, 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 right. Well. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, I'm present, Chairman. Yeah. Well, it, it's also obviously if you want, to, you're, allowed to, you're allowed to speak, but not to vote. So I just want to make sure I can hear the correct. If she wants to indicate, I can. I can see. Her. That's brilliant. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Um, so we've got the minutes of the. Meeting on the 19th of December, last time we met, um, pages 7 to 18 on your agenda. Councillor Lindham. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, on page 12, uh, I was talking about the uh, CRMP document on the third last paragraph. And um, when I mentioned state on state risk, I was talking about something a bit more substantial than terrorism and cybercrime. Uh, that, you know, I mean, uh, hopefully the Ukraine thing doesn't boil up. But I was talking more on the, uh, the traditional civil defense, you know, wartime threats and all the rest of it, whether state on state action. I hope it doesn't involve us. But I think that is a risk that we do need to put in. Uh, and uh, that, we, that we're aware of. I have raised this. Yeah, so do you want, do you, would you like to amend the minute to that? Yes, so I'll have to go with formal words. And I, I'm, I'm, I do recall your conversation. Yes, that is a... That is a, a Even though it, I think it is a low risk, I think we just need to be aware of that. All right. So with those amendments, we can... I will sign them as a correct record. Any, have I got a mover for the minutes? Shepherd Bay. Okay, so all in. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I wouldn't. Uh, any, uh, all, all those in favour? And against? Okay. Before we move on, we've had all the fractions. Any declarations of interest? Any declarations of interest for the meeting? No, no. Okay. We can revert to normal numbering now. Um, item four, issues arising from the Audit and Governance Committee. No notes, thank you, thank you, Faith. Item five, petitions and questions from the Public Understanding Orders 19 and 25. We've received none. Now we'll have a receipt of announcements, which will start with, um, with, with one from the, from the Chair. Um, on Friday, 27th of January, we received the news that Barry Martin, a firefighter from Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, tragically passed away due to serious injuries he sustained. We extend our deepest condolences and our thoughts are with Barry's family and friends at this difficult time. We also stand shoulder to shoulder with all our colleagues, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, for grieving the loss of their colleague and friend. 
I'd like to invite members to join me in observing a minute of silence for Barry, who made the ultimate sacrifice while on duty in the service of his community. Thank you, members. <laughs> Following talks within the National Joint Council on the 8th of February, arrangements in place that negotiate terms and conditions, including pay on behalf of the fire and rescue sector, the announcement of industrial action has been postponed following a revised offer from the fire and rescue service employers. The offer is as follows. A 7% increase on all basic pay rates, continuing professional development payments with effect from the 1st of July 2022, it's backdated, for all grey book roles, including control. A 5% increase on all basic pay rates and continuing professional development payments with effect from the 1st of July 2023 for all grey book roles, including control. The Fire Brigade's Union will now consult its members and this revised pay offer will be put to a ballot which will end on the 6th of March. The notification of strike action will not place, take place during this consultation period. This is a developing situation which we are monitoring closely and we will provide more information in due course. At the start of the month we welcomed 24 new firefighter apprentices. The apprentices spent two days at Whitney Wood and Ed Quarters, where they were given an introduction to the service, how we operate, and some of the equipment they'll be using in their roles. Currently, they are away on a training course at the Fire Service College in Gloucestershire. However, they will return to Berkshire to complete the final few weeks of their training course before graduating in May. I'm sure all members will join me in wishing the new firefighter apprentices the best of luck with this training programme. To take effect from the 23rd of January 2023, new fire safety regulations came into force and will impose significant new legal requirements of responsible persons for multi-occupied residential buildings. The fire safety regulations 22, 2022 was introduced to meet the Grenfell Tower Inquiry's Phase 1 recommendations. The regulations require responsible persons of high-rise residential buildings to provide information on their building to their local fire service. The information to be shared includes details of the construction of external walls, floor and building plans and information on known faults with key firefighting equipment. It's really important that responsible per persons for multi-occupied residential buildings are aware and prepared for these changes. Further information about the new fire safety regulations can be found on the services website. Following the devastating earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, Firefighters at South Fire Station have decided to host a car wash to raise money for all those impacted. The event will take place this Saturday, 18th of February, between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., with donations being split between the Turkey Syria Earthquake Appeal and the Firefighters Charity, who provide health and wellbeing support to the fire service community. A card reader will be available for payments, and the suggested minimum donation is five pounds. Firefighters from Maidenhead Fire Station will be hosting a charity car wash between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. the following day, Sunday, 19th February, to raise money for the firefighters' charity. If you're able to attend either of the events, please do. And I'd like to send my thanks to all those organising 
these events for such good causes. Our on call, our on call firefighters at Crowthorne were recently thanked by Crowthorne Parish Council during a competition run by a local business. In a competition run by the Cafe Two Sisters on Facebook, Crowthorne Fire Station was nominated by Crowthorne Parish Council for its work in the community. And I'm sure Councillor Tina Burke will be very, who's online, will be very pleased with this award. Tina Mackenzie Boff. As well as responding to incidents, the council highlighted all the events that firefighters have been involved with, including the summer of fun, carnival, and late night shopping. The crew was provided with a breakfast pastry box in recognition of their contribution. Sadly, they had to rush out for a call when the delivery arrived, but hopefully they were able to enjoy it after their return to the station. Well done to everybody at Crowthorne. And finally, in March, Brigitte Thomas, our current area manager for prevention and protection, will retire from the service. Far too young, Trick, far too young. <laughs> we are immensely grateful for all Trick's contributions to the Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service which he has made in a number of roles. Trigg joined the service in March 1993 and served at Wokingham Road, Maidenhead, Sonning, Whitley Wood and Dee Road before being promoted to station commander in 2006. Trigg became a group manager in 2014 in community safety before becoming an area manager for the service delivery in 2021. Throughout his career, Trigg has demonstrated an unwavering commitment to public safety. He has been particularly instrumental in promoting the adoption of sprinkler systems throughout the county and worked tirelessly to ensure the safety of residents living in high-rise buildings following the tragic Renfell Tower fire. Trigg has also worked hard to reduce community risk, such as by promoting water safety and awareness of the risk of wildfire during periods of heightened risk. Thank you, Trigg, for all your years of service and all the best for your retirement. Oh. Okay, that ends my <coughs> announcements. <coughs> Item seven is recommendations of committees. And there's a note of what items have been recommended by audit and governance. And items 11 and 13 were recommended by the ad management committee on the 7th of February 2023. Item eight is questions from members understanding order 30. Not received any questions from members. Item 9, notice of motion, understanding order 44. Not received any motions. Item 10 is the HMIC RFRS inspection report. Uh, we're going to note the findings and I'm going to hand over to Katie. <laughs> you know, I was just looking around the. Over to Katie Mills. Best will work on this to give a brief overview. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. I'm pleased to be able to present the outcome of our second flood inspection by HMIC FRS. As members will know, we were first inspected in January, February 2019. The on-site inspection was mostly undertaken in two weeks with a discovery and fieldwork stage. And the outcome was positive with Berkshire being judged as good as across the three main pillars of effectiveness, efficiency and people. Sitting under each of these pillars is 11 questions across the three categories, and we received 10 good judgments and one requires sorry, <laughs> a bit of cough. Um, requires improvement. The service received no causes for concern at the time, and there were 12 recommended areas for improvement. The second full inspection was delayed due to COVID, but in October 2020, HMI undertook an inspection of our response to the pandemic, and we were found to have responded well. Since that time, it's fair to say that the inspectorate has sharpened its pencil in the intervening period, with a greater degree of scrutiny being applied in the second round. To maintain the judgments given in the first round, we would have been required significant improvement to have been made. This is perhaps best demonstrated by the second inspection taking place over a six rather than two week period, with the inspection consisting of a strategic briefing, a desktop review, an interview with the Thames Valley Fire Control, partner interviews, desktop reviews, interviews with staff, focus groups, and then finally an interview with Wayne as the Chief Fire Officer. 
Uh, in addition to the six-week inspection period, we undertook pre-engagement activities, submitted a self-assessment, data, documents, and HMI undertook its own staff survey. Needless to say, it was an extensive process and one which required a significant amount of input from our staff. So the outcome. We have been judged as good once again across the three main pillars. We have improved on the last inspection with all 11 questions sitting under these pillars being rated as good. There were 12 recommended areas for improvement which are outlined in the report and once again no causes for concern. We also received two special mentions for innovative practice in relation to our consultation activity and culture, um, behaviours and values of the service. These were reflected also in the State of Fire report, which was also published in January. Our inspector, Matt Parr, noted in the summary to the report the positive and constructive way the service had engaged with the inspection and that he was pleased to see the service had made significant progress since the last inspection. And in particular, the inspection team were really complimentary about staff and their engagement with the process, and that was reiterated several times throughout. Um, so to receive such a positive report is truly a reflection of the hard work of our teams. And I'd like to thank um, particularly those that supported the inspection process, and notably Angela Smith, the inspection uh, manager. So that concludes the outcome of the presentation. I'm just going to hand over to Paul, who will just give a quick update on inspection preparations moving forward. Thank you, Katie. <coughs> um, there's an uh, excellent report that come out this time from this inspection, but uh, as uh, Katie alluded to there, the HMI have now started around three <coughs> inspections within the Fire Rescue Service. Started March this year. Um, our inspection is towards the end of the year, towards the end of 23, start of 24, we haven't got dates as yet for our inspection. Um, the focus for the next round is starting with the financial context in which the uh, fire and rescue service is working in. So that's made there to, uh, we'll help them understand where they need to look across that inspection, but we'll follow a similar process as they have done previously. So it will still continue to be the length of time, 10 week inspection progress, program with two to three weeks in service. There is a change to the um, judgment criteria where currently they grade the three pillars. They will no longer do that going forward. They will grade, as Katie has explained there, the 11 criteria underneath those judgments going forward. The actual criteria, they've added a new judgment grade as well for adequate. So now they have five areas that they could grade a service in, which is outstanding, good, <coughs> adequate, requires improvement, or inadequate. Um, as things progress, we will keep members informed as we go forward as to the date of our next inspection and any changes that are going to come along forward to the members. Uh, that, thank you. Any questions for Katie or Paul? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, on page 29 of the pack, or page 5 of the inspection report, there's a page on the service in numbers. And I was just looking at the number of home fire safety checks and the fire safety audits. Those numbers are approximately half the national average. And our costs are much lower than the national average. And I just wondered how the two might be related. So we'll try to take that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so... Within uh, Berkshire, we uh, aim to target our uh, home fire safety uh, checks or our safe and well visits um, to the people who are most vulnerable uh, to, to fire in the home. Now, by targeting uh, vulnerability, we end up engaging with people who ha have far more complex lives and, and challenges um, that, uh, that they experience. Therefore, our safe and well visits uh, on average, will take longer to complete. Um, and what I'd also point you towards there is the incidence per thousand population um, being lower than the national average as well, which I think is, is probably in part an indicator towards the fact that we're targeting the correct uh, vulnerability within society. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Councillor Linden, you had a question. Yes, Chair. Um, just a general comment first. Um, it is a very good report, and uh, I think we should be really congratulate <coughs> all our officers, firefighters, and support staff who have led this, and also councillors supporting them on the authority. 
Uh, it's also pleased that we are improving diversity, and they mentioned the uh, Leonard Cheshire interns, and we've also in our apprentices, we've had uh, a number of women in there, unlike the previous apprentices scheme, so it's good that we are attracting more, I know we need to do more, and they've been very positive on diversity with EDI. But the question I'm going to ask is on page 65, which is on the performance management process in terms of the 37 respondents who report they don't find performance reviews useful. And I just wondered if I could have a comment um, on that, please, uh, Chair, from the office. Yeah. 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 Chair, through you. I think, um, obviously, it's anonymous, so we don't know specifically about those 37 um, officers. We do... Um, make a point of engaging and monitoring, as you know, through audit and governance, the number of PDRs that are taking place. We do regularly review the PDR process, um, but in terms of the actual issue being raised to officers as a concern, uh, that was something that was not specifically raised with us. Um, I think the... I don't have concerns about the process. Um, we do offer training to both managers and to staff. Um, but because the results are anonymous and we don't get further feedback from the HMI, we have to kind of go on our own data and information. So a lot of that is a lead measure in the sense of basically we put in place training, um, we do staff feedback, and we learn our own staff feedback results, although I don't have them in front of me. Um, there is that hasn't been highlighted as an issue so um, it, it is a fact I suppose of the situation but um, to my knowledge it's not something that we've seen come through as a concern from our own staff through our own processes. Thank you very much. Councillor Hello Solomons. Thank you. The media has recently slated London, Dorset and Wiltshire fire brigades for bullying, harassment and misogyny. <coughs> and yet the inspectors gave them a glowing report for their people section and obviously didn't pick it up at all. Our own report makes no mention of that at all in, in our fire service. Um, so can the chairman please assure me that there is no bullying, harassment or misogyny in any of our fire stations or here at Newsom Court? Newsom Court. Um, well, I think in, in, in the HMIC report, they, we were actually were, were, were credited for our, our culture. So that was, that was a good thing. But what I would say is I don't think anybody could ever be complacent about it, um, as we discovered from those, some of those shocking examples. <coughs> You, you, you gave and obviously we are doing some analysis of this and there's a process that's going to report to towards in governance um, and to other committees in the future I mean I, I, I would love to be able to give an outright guarantee that, that we, we haven't any instances of that but and, and you know every, everything is crossed that we haven't but I think as you as you've said people are inspected fast inspection for that but then these, these incidents come up through social media so I think it seems that we've got to control we've got to monitor we've got to carry on the progress we've made in this area which I think is quite significant and, and really work on our equality diversity and inclusion policies going forward thank you can I just quickly come back and say can you elaborate a bit on the analysis that you're doing um the chief might want to raise <clears throat> Uh, so HMI CFRS, uh, the uh, Chief Inspector has written out to all English Fire and Rescue Services on the 7th of February requesting uh, information by return. Uh, it had to be sent in yesterday uh, in order to gather baseline information from across Fire and Rescue Services about historic cases of uh, uh, discipline, grievance, bullying, harassment or complaints where it is related to the values or culture of your service. Uh, we responded yesterday uh, with our returns because HR, as you would expect, collect and hold all of that information. So we hold that information anyway. Uh, we share that information with HMI CFRS in the data collections and the data returns that we have to send back as part of the inspection process. But we've again sent it back uh, in the spirit of complete transparency uh, with a cover letter uh, explaining the data that we've sent back to them. Uh, it is confidential information uh, uh, and they've requested it under various legislation that they operate under. 
So we've collected the data, sent it back, and that's to, to fee, uh, furnish a spotlight report that HMI CFRS referred to, uh, where they will be conducting a spotlight report based on uh, the uh, inspection data that they've gathered from the various inspections across all English Fire and Rescue Authorities, uh, and the information <coughs> and the data that they received as a result of this request in the last week, and they will furnish that report for public benefit uh, back to the sector and publish it on their website sometime towards the end of March that we will use to inform the next steps that we take. I think in the meantime, uh, what we've also done is following the independent review of culture into the London Fire Brigade by Nazir Afsal, we've conducted a gap analysis against that report. Uh, we have then taken that to our EDI steering group uh, to get that cross-checked with by steering group members and cross-referenced against our EDI action plan. Uh, so we're bringing all of that information together uh, to look at the next steps that we take on our cultural development journey uh, as a service uh, throughout the rest of this year uh, and, and into any leadership development work that we do, uh, middle manager engagement sessions, uh, keeping in touch calls with staff, but also general staff development to maintain the cultural progress. So we do, I believe we are doing a lot of work in this space. We intend to do more, uh, a lot more work in this space. I think the HMI CFRS Spotlight Report, we hope, helps uh, direct the sector uh, and, and maybe identify things that we haven't thought of, uh, which we do, because I, I probably, if I may, Chair, go a, a, a step further and say that I, I'm afraid I cannot assure you, Councillor, that we do not have uh, such incidents going on in our service. What I will say is I genuinely believe that the majority of our staff are dedicated, diligent public servants who do a fantastic job day in, day out, uh, and want to do the best for the public that they serve. However, we cannot uh, ignore the fact that uh, the culture that's been exposed in other services may not exist in pockets in our service. We have a very traditional, quite old culture, the sector does. <clears throat> I think Royal Berkshire is at the more positive end of that. Uh, but until we've baselined and we understand that, we don't know whether people feel fully comfortable to raise issues that they think are inappropriate. And that's the point we need to get to in the service so that we have complete confidence that people call out inappropriate behaviour and we can drive it out of the service. Uh, I genuinely think people, the majority of people come to work to do a really good job and behave in the most appropriate way. But I do think we will find uh, issues and pockets of poor behaviour that we need to deal with that are misogynistic, sexist, racist, homophobic, uh, you know, and the rest, and discriminate all people. Uh, but we will root it out, uh, and we will make sure that people feel safe uh, to bring their, their whole self to work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And, and the gap analysis is, is going to be reported to members, I think. I, I mentioned all the governments are actually <coughs> committed that we could, we could, we could, we could send it to, because I think it's important the members have oversight. I think initially, Chair, we've put it on the forward plan for fire authority, a uh, future fire authority <coughs> meeting. Uh, but then after that, we'll work yes. in the governance. Yes. Uh, yeah. the, the private government. Good to see the forward plan. So, thank, thank, thanks, Val. Thank, thanks for the question, Councillor Simon. So, it's a, it's a good one because often these reports are done inspections, and then a month, a year later, some shocking thing happens, and people. And there is almost a gap in the reality of the, of the inspection to what's actually happening on the ground. Um, look, I, I, any more questions? Any more questions on this? That, look, I just I did a management committee, and I know Co Co Councillor Duddy did as well. Thank, thank everybody involved with this inspection process. It, 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 it's been a lot of work. When they, it started, it was supposed to be described as light touch. Well, it was anything but took up a lot of time and also a lot of staff members were engaged at all levels in this in, in inspection and we've ended up with, 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 with report. I think there was only 16 authorities across the country that have got goods in all three of the, of the pillars uh, and, and, long, and long may it continue. And so obviously we move on now to the further round of inspections looking, 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 looking to Paul and you know 
I don't think, I know that as an authority, we're not complacent in these areas and we'll pick up some of the recommendations in the report and work on them because that's, that's the way, it's a continuous improvement. So, you know, what a great result for, you know, the people of Barsha are getting a great service, you know, and uh, long may it continue. Thanks. Thanks. Councillor Dudley. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I was waiting to overcome questions before I ask yes, this. Um, I'd like to add my congratulations to all the um, senior leadership team and all the staff that undertook um, hosting the inspectors um, and um, getting the document pack ready and getting all the interviews done and making sure that um, our inspectors saw Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service in the best light that it could. Um, I'd also like to add my congratulations to uh, to you, to everybody that um, took part in this. And it is a fantastic result. Three goods with no, with no sub-areas below good is, is something to behold. Uh, we know, don't we, that the inspectors this year, and excuse my vernacular, sharpened their pencils somewhat in this institution. <coughs> and I think if we'd have stood still, uh, we would have found ourselves in a worse position than we were. So I think that's something to celebrate um, and something to shout out, shout out that the people of Royal Berkshire are, are getting good value for money, good service, and looking after their people as best we can. Um, the fact of the matter is that this inspection was supposed to be no burden on, on, the, uh, on the service. Well... No. Katie, I'm sure you agree. This was absolutely no burden at all, was it? It didn't take any of your time or weeks or weekends or nights uh, that you and your team undertook. So congratulations from us as well. And, of course, you wouldn't expect me to miss the opportunity to remind everybody that, of course, that this inspection inspected the fire service whilst it was under Conservative administration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dudley. Any more comments on this? Okay. So we're after note the report. We have to note it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> we move on to um, item 11, which is the annual budget. The main item of business um, tonight. And we've got a separate. That was. <laughs> we've got a. We've got a separate separate pack with, with, with the updated papers, which I thought members have uh, received. So I'm going to ask uh, Connor to. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, Councillor. Councillor Brooks, do you want to speak first? I'd yeah. like to introduce the. Yes, thank, 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 thank you. As we agreed before the meeting, um, I'd like to remind people that the budget we've worked on in this year was bequeathed to us by the outgoing Conservative administration. We've worked our way through it as best we could. Um, and I'm pleased to put the budget before you tonight, which are the eight items, which I think is, uh, is very good. Um, we've worked hard on it. Connor and his, his staff uh, worked very hard on it. It's balanced without using reserves. Um, we've managed to top up the reserves. We have had, as you know, Chairman, We've had to use some of the budget reserve, contingent reserve this year uh, to what we believe will help balance this year's budget. The budget we put before you this evening tops that budget reserve back up to where it pretty much was. We've now modelled since the management committee last week, which recommended this budget to the authority, we've modelled the new NJC offer to the Grey Book staff of 7% in, in the current year, 5% next year. Um, Connor will go into the implications of that, but I'm pleased to say this budget does not cut any core services, does not introduce any savings that diminish this service in any way, does not particularly slow our progress in investing in uh, efficiencies, um, and I think it's uh, got a hell of a lot going for it. I think the recommendation that we take the five pounds which is in your paperwork um, the five pound charge precept levy uh, which we consulted on and a very favorable reply from the public 
I think is appropriate. Um, it helps the service stay healthy. And if we can hopefully get an agreement on this pay award, uh, we will be looking in good shape for the year ahead. Uh, the strategic, strategic asset investment framework is also in here. And if that's approved tonight, we're looking at £10 million investment over four or five years. So all in all, I think I commend this and I move it, Chairman. Um, subject to Colin now going into more detail. Uh, he'll tell you about one or two um, sort of KPI parameters that we've introduced into our, our budgeting framework as well. Um, and then we'll take questions and go into debate and uh, we'll handle them as they come. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Wilkes. I'll be, I'll be seconding and reserving my right, but um, Connor, do you want to just give us uh, an overview of the, yes. of the budget? Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so as, as Councillor Brooks has mentioned, um, and also the Chair in his announcements, um, there has been a significant development um, since the draft 23-24 budget was presented to the Management Committee last week. And that is that the latest payable for Great Goods staff is an increase of 7% from July 22 and 5% from July 23. So I shall go through the um, details of what that means shortly. And as Councillor Brooks says, the overall headline is that we still have a balanced budget 23, 24, and three subsequent years. And in addition, £573,000 will be added back to the budget contingency reserve in 23, 24. So the budget itself is comprised of eight documents, and these are attached as appendices A to H. So I'll take you through the um, key points in each document, um, and I'll start with the medium-term financial plan, which is appendix B, and that starts on page 15 of the pad. So the medium-term financial plan sets out the main components of the revenue budget, and how they change um, between the current year and 2023. So there are three funding streams to the budget, and we've got council tax, government grants, business rates, and then on the net expenditure side, and we'll be looking at savings and additional income is unavoidable pressures, pay assumptions, and the revenue implications of capital expenditure. So starting with um, the preset increases that have been built into the NTFP, they start on page 18. So the NTFP builds in a £5 increase in 23-24, followed by 2.99% in 24-25, and then 1.99% in two subsequent years. Um, the government has already announced in the local government settlements this year an upper limit of 2.9 million um, by authorities in 24.5. The plan then assumes a return to the standard increase um, of 1.99% in subsequent years, which would be in line with current inflation and predictions. Um, Precept increase then feeds into the table on uh, page 19 of the pack, and um, shows towards the bottom of the table, and that shows that um, council tax is going to be 28.79 million 23-24, plus the collection and fund of 13,000 pounds. Um, the five pound increase in the precept generates just under 1.8 million pounds. <coughs> Increase in the capital tax base of 1.41% generates £400,000. Returning to the top of the table, um, you see that the government settlement funding assessment is made up of revenue support grant and business rates baseline and business rates top up grant. Um, revenue support grant is going up by 10.1% in 23 24. Business base, uh, business rates baseline will increase by 7.2% due to business rate revaluation. However, the business rates top up ground has decreased by 5.4%, although there has been some compensation for this in separate section 31 business rate grants. Um, actual business rates due for 23 24 as notified by the unitary authorities was in line with the government's um, baseline figure being just 6,000. 
Over the Section 31 business rate grants were £719,000 above the government's baseline of £1.259 million. Going forward, as the COVID effects of additional reliefs um, unwind and business rates grants should return to being more predictable. And the final source of funding there is the services grant of £277,000, and this fell due to the reversal of the uh, increase in the auction. So in total, income for 23-24 will be £41.975. So whilst the uplift in funding and for 2024 is very welcome, it is insufficient to cover the significant increase in pay and non-pay costs. Um, as pressures in the pace budget for 2023 million pounds. Given this budget gap, an efficiencies exercise was carried out, which identified savings of 774,000 pounds. And together with additional income of 487, with a reduction in the base budget of 1.261 million or 324. And I'll say a bit more about the efficiency and productivity plan in a moment, but the efficiencies and additional income as it feeds into the NTFP is shown on page 20 of the plan. Budget pressures are shown on page 22 of the pack and I'll cover the um, non pay pressures first. So the um, 1.261 million of savings, efficiencies, and additional income has generated headroom to fund some additional budget bids. And the service has been running with several <coughs> um, posts over the last few years to deal with additional workloads that came about through new regulations or requirements. In reality, this additional workload has proved not to be temporary, and therefore these posts will be built into the base budget. And the cost of these bids for 2324 is £290,000. In addition to bids, there are other significant non pay pressures, and the utility costs are currently anticipated to rise by around £400,000 based on the forecast by our supplier. We also have cuts to the filing grant that will lead to a pressure of £160,000. £1, and other unavoidable pressures will cost £241,000. So, altogether, um, unavoidable non pay costs um, will amount to £1.361 That said, um, the biggest budget pressure relates to pay. So in building the 23-24 budget, account has been taken of both, uh, or account needs to be taken of both grey book and green book payables for 22-23 as well as 23-24. Now the reason for this is in 22-23, the budgeted pay assumption for both grey and green book staff was 2.5%, and the green book pay award has been settled at a level that is equivalent to over 5%, and therefore will add a pressure of 216000 into the base budget. And the, the latest two-year offer to Great Book staff of 7% from July 22 and 5% from July 23 will add a pressure of £1.863 into the base. And the assumption regarding the pay award for Green Book staff in 23 24 is a 4% increase and that will cause another pressure of 337000 in addition, um, £453,000 has been added to the base to reflect actual overtime costs. £157,000 has been added for pay increments, and £54,000 has been added to reflect current payments to staff. Um, the reversal of the NI increase has also been factored in, and this reduces the pay budget. So, in total, the increase in pay costs amounts to £2.855 million. And the impact of capital investment on the revenue budget is shown on page 23 of the pack. Um, increasing the 22-23 pay award assumption for grey book staff, and which happened since the management committee meeting, means that the increase in direct revenue funding of capital has been scaled back from £468,000 to £46,000. And this now means there will be additional borrowing in years three and four, the MTFP and total borrowing will be 2.1 million. 
um, despite the, the increase in borrowing capital program as set out in the um, strategic asset investment framework um, remains a full report in financing costs of the additional borrowing that have been built into the um, TFP. Um, an important, another important feature of the MTFP um, stems from the need to fund the current year's deficit from the budget contingency reserve. So depletion of this reserve would leave very little headroom to do with the budgeted costs that may arise in the future. It is therefore important that this reserve is replenished. Unfortunately, there is sufficient one-off income in the 23 budget. <coughs> budget to allow £573,000 to be added back into the budget contingency reserve. Given that cost pressures continue to be unpredictable, it is imperative that the authority has sufficient reserves at its disposal to deal with budget variations. Um, a summary of all of these reasons is shown on page 24 of the TAC. And total income for 23-24 is £41.975 million. Current year's budget is 38.446 million. Adding on the cost pressures and subtracting the efficiency plan savings gives a net pressure of 2.956 million. And that leaves 573,000 pounds uh, to replenish the budget contingency uh, reserve. Um, finally, I just wanted to point out that the MTFP shows income for each year in terms of expenditure, it shows um, changes between years. Um, and Councillor Loco has, has provided um, some very welcome feedback in suggesting that uh, the profile of expenditure um, would be a good addition to the MTFP. And so I shall add that to the MTFP that's published on the website. Um, so that's an overview of the MTFP. Um, I'll now turn to the, the efficiency and productivity. C. Um, I've already mentioned the, the immediate efficiencies that have been built into the budget for 23 24, and they total £774,000. Uh, these savings and efficiencies are broken down into four categories. So they come from savings from changes in what we do, There's also savings from improved ways of working, and contractual savings, and also the disestablishment of vacant posts. In terms of the additional um, income generated, this mostly comes from additional interest <coughs> and investments, which amounts to four hundred and fourteen thousand pounds. There's also seventy-three thousand pounds in cost border and partnership In addition to these immediate savings um, and income, there are also efficiencies um, and twenty-four percent and twenty-five twenty-six from investor save projects. So from 24-25, uh, there will be an £84,000 saving per annum in the installation of LED lighting. And from 25-26, a £46,000 saving per annum from the installation of solar PV systems. Uh, the plan also incorporates wider fire sector objectives and has agreed nationally to deliver an increase in productivity of 3% by 24-25. The value for money assessment undertaken through Improving Services Limited identified various opportunities that would increase capacity to allow staff to become more productive. And one of the most important conclusions from the report is that process automation will significantly improve productivity and efficiency across all staff groups. The authority has therefore identified several areas where process automation will deliver a significant increase in productivity, and the details of these can be found on pages 35 and 36 of the um, Turning then to the Strategic Asset Investment Framework, which is Appendix D. Um, this document sets out the financial provision for capital works over a 10 year period. It's important to state that the figures in the safe are only provisions and indicative of the cost of the works. Authorisation to spend or only granted once a business case for each project has been submitted to the management committee and the governance arrangements are set out on the final page of the safe. 
Over the next four years, it's anticipated that capital expenditure will be just under £16 million, pounds, just under £10 million will be spent on property, £5 million on fleet and equipment, and just under £1 million on ICT. And this level of expenditure is both necessary for the corporate and foreign costs have been built into the NTFP. The next major project and um, the authority will be the redevelopment of the training centre facilities at Woodley Good. And this is scheduled to be completed over the next two years. Early feasibility work on the project suggests that the cost of the reprovisioned facilities is estimated to be around 3.65 million. This figure is currently only a financial provision and has been used for planning purposes. But in line with established practice, the project will be developed into a full business case and for detailed consideration and approval and by management committee later in 2023. In addition to the basic requirements to renew and replace ageing assets, um, SAFE continues to focus on improving our facilities to support, attract and retain a diverse workforce and better enable our staff to manage the talents that may encounter during incidents. In addition, the SAFE now places greater emphasis on introducing green technologies so that we can reduce energy costs and our carbon footprint going forward. Um, moving on then to the um, reserves policy, that's um, attached to the E. Section 42A of the Local Government Finance Act 1992 um, requires preceptive authorities to have regard to the level of reserves needed to meet the estimated future of federal debt when calculating the council tax requirements. Within the existing statutory and regulatory framework, it's the responsibility of the finance officer applies on the level of reserves that should be held and to ensure there are clear protocols for their establishment and use. Um, our reserves policy therefore sets out the following principles. Um, we will maintain the general reserve at current levels to at least 5% of the revenue budget. We will maintain the budget contingency reserve at 3% of the revenue budget. Um, we will maintain at least one million in the development fund to take advantage of joint ventures or major investor save initiatives. We will look to replenish the development fund to its March 2022 funds of um, three million pounds when circumstances allow, and we use capital receipts to fund a block. So reserve movements are shown on page 74 of the pack. And the current year's deficit is now anticipated to be and based on the latest growth of the award. In 23-24, the budget contingency reserve will be topped off through an appropriation from the revenue account of £573,000, as well as a transfer of £452,000 from the development fund. And as we ensure that by the end of 23-24, the budget contingency reserve will be percent of the revenue budget. Under section 25 of the Local Government Act 2003, the Chief Finance Officer is obliged to report on the robustness of the estimates and the adequacy of the proposed financial reserves. I believe that the overall estimate of income and expenditure used in the 23-24 budget are robust. The Treasury strategy can be found in Appendix F. Um, projected capital expenditure and finance are shown on page 83 of the pack. The table showed that for 23-24 and 24-25 capital expenditures fully funded through capital and revenue resources. However, for 25-26 and 26-27, there is a financing need of 1.782 million and 2018. I mean, taking into account refinancing requirements and statutory amounts set aside to repay loans and maturity, and there will be a requirement for net additional borrowing of 1.606 million, 25.26, and half a million in 26.27. And the two changes have been made to the 23-24 uh, Treasury policy. Uh, the first is on page 97 of the pack. 
as has always been the case, and finance is possible. And the budget is shown in the future. However, the 23-24 policy introduces an upper limit of 2.5% this ratio, and this will be reviewed annually. This will provide an additional parameter when considering affordability of the capital programme. Uh, the second change is um, the policy introduced as an ethical dimension of investing. So while our principal considerations remain security, liquidity and yield, we will now only transact with counterparties from countries that are rated free. House. Countries that we would transact with the show in page 100 of the pack. Compared to the previous policy, we will now not transact with counterparties from Singapore, Abu Dhabi, and Qatar. These in charges and for 23 24 will be found in 10 percent um, The 23 24 budget for TBSES. And was agreed by the Joint Committee in December and needs to be approved by each authority that is attached as Appendix H. It should be noted that the pay assumptions used in, um, in that budget and um, 5% for the committee is So based on the latest payoff, there's likely to be an adverse variance of around £50,000. The possibility the budget of pay awards was discussed at the Joint Committee meeting and it would be the contingency of 150,000 and which is sufficient to deal with any savings. So um, returning then to the, the key decision um, of the paper, and um, this is to approve an increase in the um, anti council tax preset of five pound twenty-three twenty-four by adopting the formal resolution in Appendix A. And the responses from the, the public consultation that was conducted last month uh, on increasing the preset by £5, they highlighted the continuing squeeze on household budgets. Despite this, though, 87.74% um, of respondents um, supported the £5 annual increase. Pound rise in the precept is an increase of 6.76%. This is lower than the current rate of inflation that was announced today of 10.1%, and lower than the cumulative impact of the pay awards. Hence, as stated earlier, the importance of the efficiency and productivity plan in supporting the delivery of a balanced budget for 23-24. Indeed, it's Crucial to remember that on current levels of income, the new Great Book Pay Award means that the current year deficit is projected to rise from £648,000 to £954,000. So the mixture of efficiencies and additional income in the 23-24 budget um, is necessary to eliminate what would otherwise be a large and persistent deficit. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Colin, for a comprehensive review of the papers. Uh, members, any questions to comment before we move on to any debate? Any questions? No? Okay. Um, Councillor Brooks has already moved the, um, the, the budget and, and all, as, all aspects of it, all the recommendations. I'm going to uh, second it and reserve my right. Does any other member wish to speak to this item? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, well, it may supr surprise um, members of that actually we're going to support this budget. Um, as you know, I and most of the Conservative groups spent the last three years lobbying government to try and achieve £5 for fire for this authority. And I'm pleased to see that, once again, in the budget, the £5 for fire has been, has been, uh, has been given. Um, it would, of course, therefore be perverse of us to vote against a £5 increase in budget that we lobbied so hard to achieve. Um, and um, I think that 10p per week per band D household, even in these Tory times, should be affordable. <coughs> um, I don't think, as a Conservative group, we should play politics with the budget of a fire service. 
I think it's far too important for that. Um, and therefore, we decided that we would not be voting against this purely on a political stand. Or indeed, we will not be abstaining from it because I think that that completely waters down our place on the fire authority. We should always exercise our right to vote for and against. And in this case, I believe we should be voting for this budget. I think that we should also take this opportunity to thank Connor and his team for putting together what is, you know, a fantastic document pack um, and explaining it so well, so well. And also thank all those members that sat on the Budget Working Party Group that worked to achieve this budget. <coughs> Therefore, I believe that we should be supporting this motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dudd. Councillor Lennon. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I would echo the remarks made by Councillor Dudley uh, on this. I was really worried at the beginning that we would really be struggling and I'm grateful that the government has given us that opportunity uh, for the Fiver for Fire and also uh, given us some additional support. We haven't got everything, but I think I'm really pleased that we, we haven't got this worry this year uh, on our budget and I know... Uh, I've had some assurances as well from other councillors here. I just wanted to raise a point on SAFE. I know we've got a property development working committee, and I'm really pleased that we'll be looking for collaborative uh, ventures as such. And, you know, when I went on the visit on Caversham Road with the chair and others, uh, certainly this £1.219 million was really needed for a 1937 building to meet all our uh, areas. Um, I've also visited Newbury on a numerous amount of occasions, and certainly looking at on the outside of the Amber, so it's even worse than our building. And hopefully with a bit of collaboration, and certainly with West Berkshire Council and other, uh, other authorities, we might be collaborative to do better on, on the Newbury uh, upgrade, and certainly again on uh, Wokeham as well. Uh, but it's just points there, and hopefully we may get government to helping out the capital expenditure scheme, what we need to do to making sure we have a uh, fit for purpose within our uh, buildings. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Captain. I'm, I'm going to second, then I'm going to ask Councillor Brooks to make some comments and, and to speak to sum up. Sorry, Councillor Benningworth. So I, I, I'm going to take it before I second. So uh, over thank, to you. thank you, Chair. Um, I just let's say I applaud uh, the budget, um, and I'd like to also uh, commend the uh, uh, ethical investment. Um, I like I like the sound of that. Um, I'm proud of the fact that we handle over the finances in a robust enough state. And um, congratulations to officers for putting together the sound budget. Yes. Any other member wish to just check the team can see what I want to say? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it's sort of indicate on Windows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Councillor Mackenzie Boyle, if you want to say anything, you don't have to. Oh, Chairman, no, thank you. I've been listening. Great interest here. And I absolutely endorse Councillor Dudman's work. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. So I'm, Jeff has moved. I'm formally seconding the, the motion. Um, from the chair, I mean, I would also like to thank Connor. You know, I think you saw from his presentation the exhausting detail that he goes in to repair this budget and the immense amount of work for himself and other officers in, in reaching this budget in a very, very situation with the threat of industrial action, with, 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 with unbudgeted inflation pressures. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and other and other aspects which made made it very very challenging. I'd also like, as Councillor Dudley said, to thank the all party budget working party. That did include Councillor Mockero, who sadly can't be with us tonight. And, uh, and I say, in the spirit of what Councillor Dudley said, this important budget. I think the budget working party did work within that spirit, and you know, made constructive suggestions. And we had discussions around the the, the industrial action and the, and the level. <laughs> Uh, uh, level of support we're going to put for that in the budget, how we're going to itemise that. But we've reached a good resolution, I think, with that. And, and thankfully, thankfully, and hopefully, we will be avoiding industrial action. And the, the figures that we put in the budget of 7 and 5% for Craybrook staff will be accurate 
and that gave us some budget certainty going forward because I know that was that that, that was uh, challenging. And as Councillor Dudley said, uh, seventy-eight pounds per year on the average on Van D for the sort of service, the good service that we've heard about tonight is extremely good value for money for for the for the people of Berkshire, and the five pounds five for five ten pence a week um, in addition is, I think, hopefully manageable for most in, in this cost of uh, living crisis. And it was supported by 87% of the people that responded. And the 6%, as, as Mr. Byrne pointed out, is below the rate of inflation. A rate of inflation we all hope does come down significantly because that will help to ease some of, some of, some of those um, pressures. I'm also, as Councillor Benningworth also indicated, I'm very pleased on the territory management the ethical stance we've taken. I know other councils, know myself, Reading Borough Council, we've, we've adopted that principle and um, where we only invest our money in, um, in countries with, with, with a with full functioning democracy and, as so I say, non authoritarian rule, I think is probably the guideline we, we adopt there. So I, I'm really pleased to see that. Um, just a little bit there on, on government funding, and I, I'm not going to really make a sort of massive political point, but I think we do need to, to continue to talk to government, whoever's running the country, to properly fund the fire service in our public public services. I mean, the fire for fire was very welcome, and, and the lobbying that we did proved very effective. And again, that was cross-party lobbying to MPs uh, right across across the, the sector. But it is nonetheless residents that are paying that money to to help fund the fire services extra and above. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, we would obviously as councillors like to keep council tax low but also to provide excellent value for money. But I think the service and the sector does need extra funding, not least to deliver on some of the strategic asset framework beyond 2025-26, where I think we're spending 13 million. I think the ask is for nearly 30 million. So there's a gap that we need to bridge that so we can make sure all our, all our stations are fit for purpose and have modern facilities. So that's going to be a challenge for the authority going forward. And I think... You know, hopefully, with you know, with political connections, with with lobbying from 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 all the different uh, mechanisms within the fire service, we can reach a situation where the fire service is properly funded, and we can bring about hopefully some of the reforms that we also hope to see in the future. But I commend this budget and the work that's gone to it, and I commend Councillor Brooks for the work that he's he's put in uh, in putting it together. And I'm going to hand over to him to to, to, to sum up. A couple of things to add in. From my experience, going back a long time with the fire service, everybody respects it very much indeed. It's the service they like to have there but don't want to use. But they have a great respect for our service, our firefighters. And I don't think they begrudge the money they pay for it, as can be seen by a consultation response. So I think it's good value for money, excellent value for money, a good budget put together. I'm particularly grateful uh, for Councillor Dudley and his group's support. And I'm a guy who likes to tackle things head on. And he was a bit, he smarted a bit last year when my group abstained in the garage at Thiel, I seem to remember. It's very cold. <laughs> and I remember now it's largely to do with the detail we would like to have seen in the report, which I hope is now in there this year. Uh, so it wasn't political in as much as, let's make a point, we'll abstain. We wanted to see something better. And there's a lot of detail going to this this year. Very good presentation by Connor. You couldn't wish for more detail and information behind your paperwork. And I really think we've come up with a good result. And if this is supported across party, I think that will be good for the authority. And I move it with that statement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Brooks. Okay, we now have to move, as is the way of these things, to a recorded vote. Uh, and, and sadly, the people who are, are present online can't can't vote um, in, in that. But I'm taking it on block, Jim. Uh, and we're going to take yes, and we're going to take the the recommendations on block two point one to two point eight. No, no, we're taking the recommendations on block. So, yes, thank you, uh, Councillor Brooks. We are taking 2.1, 6 of your players, 2.8. All those items that we've spoken about, so we're going to take them on block. So, I'm going to quickly move through the support or not. It starts with. Yeah, but I think. Um, 
Faith is going to undertake a roll oh. call by summoning. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Order. I've got it here, but over when to members, Faith. I can. When the members may ask for you can indicate yes. when you're for or against your state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. You do a Faith rather than me. It would be far more efficient than Councillor Bateson. Four. Councillor Bennyworth. Four. Councillor Bateson. Four. Councillor Brooks. Four. Councillor Brown. Four. Councillor Bennyworth. Four. Councillor Cannon. Four. Councillor Dar. Four. Councillor Dudley? Four. Councillor Gittins? Four. Councillor Hillier Simons? Four. Councillor Linden? Four. Councillor Lovelock? Four. Councillor Malik? Four. Councillor Morgan? Four. Councillor Shepherd Debay? Four. Councillor Mike Smith? Four. Councillor Olaco? Four. Councillor Werner? Four. It's unanimous. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, members. It's important to say. We move on. Thank you very much. Yes. Item 12 is the Royal Archer of Royalty Pay Policy Statement. So I'm looking around. It's. Right, thank you. Um, so, as members are aware, we're required to prepare a pay policy statement each financial year in accordance with Section 38 of the Localism Act um, 2011. Um, the Act includes information on the remuneration for all staff as defined by the Act. Um, all information for staff um, on staff in post and salary for the pay multiples in this report um, is taken from data for the 31st of October 2022. Um, it's not been necessary to amend the format of the pay policy statement um, this year, but a number of amendments have been made, um, and this year they include um, an updated section on the firefighters pension scheme and the impact on RBFRS, um, and this includes the removal of the employer and employee contribution information relating to the closure of the 92 and 2006 pension schemes. Um, inclusion of information relating to enhanced mileage rates for casual, essential and leased car users. Inclusion of information relating to special severance payments or SSPs, uh, which are made to employees when they leave employment. Inclusion of information relating to the alignment of the non operational ACFO role to the pay award arrangements for the Deputy Chief Executive Director of Corporate Services, uh, which was previously agreed by the Fire Authority. Um, and also an amendment to the pensions policy section relating to the Ombudsman's case on discretions around abatement. And again, this is previously agreed by the Fire Authority in December. Uh, the authority is invited to approve the pay policy statement um, for 2024. And that's it in summary. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them at this point. Any questions? I mean, this is an annual statement we have to adopt, but again, I know it's a lot of work goes in to prepare these documents, so thanks. Thank, thanks very much. Um, any member wish to speak on this item? Okay. All those in favour of approving the pay policy? Any against? No. That's unanimous. Thanks very much, members. Okay, so item 13. Who is it? Another hardy perennial <coughs> annual scheme of allowances for members. Graham, you're going to introduce this. Thank you, Chair. And as some people will indicate this is a perennial item. The authority is required to approve annually a, um, a scheme of allowances in advance of the financial year to rise. And historically, the authority has always uh, approved uh, the station link to the Green Book Pay Award. Um, the recommendations are a, a of recommendations from the management committee. By way of explanation, um, as many members will be aware through their involvement with councils, uh, the NJC Green Book Pay Award was not. Expressed as a percentage this year, it was there was a flat rate payment. Um, some councils have sought to look at the median increase across all the spine spine points. The proposal that was 
put forward to the Council Committee and it's been recommended to you this evening is to use the NJC Green Book um, Allowances Award, which was pegged at 4.04. As I said, the recommendation is set out for you there at 89. Any questions for Graham? No. Does any member wish to speak to this item? Councillor Dunn. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just to reiterate what uh, the monitor officer, uh, monitoring officer was saying. Um, previously, we used to go through a painful exercise once every four years where we'd get a, an ind independent report. Um, I think it was South East Employers. <coughs> Which, which would look at the allowances um, and make a recommendation. And it, it was painful because obviously this was done every three or four years and of course people didn't understand that when they made a recommendation to increase the allowances by 10 or 15 or 20 percent, that was for a four year period. Um, but of course the headline said that politicians give themselves a massive pay rise. Um, what we've done in the last few years is link it to the same pay rise that our hard-working staff achieve themselves, which I think is much fairer um, and at 4.04% is less than the precept that we've, um, we've just levied on our, on our members of the public. So I think it's very fair um, and members work very, very hard for their allowances um, and of course there is always the opportunity that if members don't believe that they should have such an increase in their allowances, then they don't have to take it. Um, so I'll be supporting this chair, thank you. Thank you, absolutely. I'm going to move this. Have I got a second? So Brown. Is it moving this? I, I, you know, I can't what Councillor Dudley says in terms of the say the invidiousness of um, and, the, and the difficulty of setting member allowances and we're going to look to the example of the Houses of Parliament where independent panels have recommended increases and to see the backlash that, 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 that's received. I think this report actually sets a, a sensible um, halfway house in a sense between the medium line that was recommended that some councils are doing with the, with the, with, through the NJC um, and we, we've set the scheme based on allowances and I'm particularly keen on this because, as I stressed to the Managing Committee when I spoke to this, we actually don't get paid by the Fire Authority. We're not paid employees of the Fire Authority or indeed by our local councils. We receive a scheme of allowances. There is a distinction. Obviously, we pay tax on those allowances, but there's a difference. So I'm pleased to see we are pegging it to allowances, and I hope that going forward we can continue to do that because I think there is a distinction, and I think it's, it's, an, it's an important one as regards as regards members. So I'm happy to move this. Councillor Brown is happy to second it. All those in favour? Any against? Councillor Werner? This one. Okay, two against. <coughs> Any abstentions? Oh, that's carried. That's carried. Thanks very much, members. Okay, move on to agenda item 14, which is the Emergency Service Sustainability Charter. And are you going to speak to us? Yes, thank you, Chair, and good evening, members. Um, the Emergency Services Environmental and Sustainability Group, of which Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue is a member, is made up of UK police forces, fire and rescue services, ambulance services, and other emergency services who have come together as a collective to support and drive sustainability improvements within the emergency services sector. From this group, the Sustainability Charter has been developed as a high-level strategic document with the aim of forging a collective and collaborative intent to improving sustainability and to support the embedding of sustainability within individual organisations, whilst adopting three main sustainability principles of people, planet and public purse. The Charter has adopted the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are shown in the pictograms within the Charter, to provide a consistent framework which considers all areas of sustainability. 
key goals are linked under the People, Planet and Public Purse headings to enable members to identify relevant areas of sustainability and incorporate these back into their own organisations. Our recent carbon footprint assessment undertaken by Planet Mart shows that around two thirds of our carbon output come from our buildings. Within the strategic asset investment framework, which has just been approved by members, areas for sustainability improvements have been identified across the estate um, with, speci with specific initiatives intended to reduce our carbon output to be carried out over the next four years, subject to the required approvals. Some of the benefits of signing up to the Charter are detailed in section 3.7 of the report. In summary, by signing up to the Charter, Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service can demonstrate its organisational intent to improve its overall sustainability whilst working collaboratively with other organisations yet maintain an organisationally specific approach on how to do this by developing our own plans and strategies. Thank you and happy to thank, thank you. Any questions on this? Councillor Hayley Simons. Thank you. Um, obviously I agree with the principle behind this. But I'm a little bit concerned about um, page 1115.1, which says there are no immediate implications of any potential future spending mm. or require separate approval. My question is, by agreeing this, do we make it inevitable or even likely that there will be future improvements and therefore future spend? Um, do you want to take that in terms of what what the likely sort of yeah, so obviously like, yeah. of course Jeffrey you so in terms of signing up to the charter per se as a standalone commitment there is no um, immediate spend however as I mentioned um, when I talk through it there there are specific initiatives that are identified in the safe um, which in order to improve our sustainability would require investment and therefore we would bring back um, for appropriate approval um, a business case detailing that to draw down on the money to um, spend to improve our sustainability but along with that we would anticipate that, there would, that would come with some revenue savings so to sort of close the loop if you like that in order to improve there will be a need for investment further down the line. So in other words, Chairman, 5.1 is not strictly accurate. There's an agenda behind that. Or aware of it. But it will come to for approval of any spend and it will go through the normal process. But this is a framework, isn't it, we can work to. But Mark, you wanted to... Yeah, I just wanted to add really, just in terms of giving members confidence um, about progression towards the specifics of meeting uh, requirements or the principles of the Charter. So you'll be aware of the Property Development Working Group. Uh, we have uh, one uh, lined up for mid-March. Uh, and within that particular meeting, item one of that meeting will be about reviewing the terms of reference for that group. And the intention is that that group is broadened out, the scope of that group is broadened out. So it will effectively be the state's development group <coughs> sustainability. And the intention is that members at that in that space will be able to monitor progress, not just in terms of the initiatives directly around buildings and our state, but more broadly in line to the plan that we anticipate from the Charter. Um, but as Andy said, uh, in terms of our spend, directly, uh, that is uh, included in the... Uh, Thank you. Helpful. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Any Question for Council, Luca. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's quite a commendable objective. But I'm just trying to understand, really. When you say you want to do this and there's no equality and diversity implications, particularly when you're talking about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which that kind of sits at the heart of it. So I'm just trying to understand what you mean by there are no implications. That's, that's it. I'm going to take that. It just, it just says there are no media quality or diversity implications, but I, I understand where Council Loco is going. And do you want to just take that? It's just yeah, so I think, you know, as we develop these projects, obviously we're very keen and part of our framework of, you know, getting approvals for, um, for certain project streams, you know, involves the quality impact assessments. So, we, you know, we look at individual or specific projects um, as a specific project and understand the implications 
that would maybe come through them. But as the charter per se is an overall arching um, intent, that's why that's that's why that's written like that. If I may just come, I think you've answered the question because you talk about looking at the project implications of that, and I think that's really what that statement is because you can't say when you're looking at the UNSDG that there are no equality and diversity implications because you know. The primary purpose of the UNSDG is targeted towards normalizing things. So whatever you want to do, and you've answered it, by, maybe you just want to rephrase that and you know, put that in, your, in that statement. Really. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Can, uh, Council Dalton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to ask a question. I've, I've been reading through the charter on page 113 and 114 of the agenda. Um, and the last bullet point, um, of the things that we are effectively signing up for by being a signatory to this charter is that we will maximise social value contributions through the contracts we procure. And whilst I don't disagree with that, I'd just like to know what is the what what would be the <coughs> leading. Um, the leading reason to 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 to, um, to procure a contract would it be we'd take a more expensive contract if it has a better social value, or do we look for best value for money? Because you know I don't want to think that, you know we should be locked into a corner here. It's a good, good question. Thanks. John, you, you, oh, good. Yeah, I, I mean I'd like to give some assurance that we continue to. Best value for money. Um, that's, this this, that's is, good a, enough this is a sophistication of, of that. Uh, and what we're trying to do in the national uh, states space uh, is to develop a methodology to understand that social value, how we measure that, and the importance that we place on that. And of course, given that we are tied into that world, we we'll bring that learning back into the service as our intention. Chief. Thank you, Deb. Sorry. I think that, yeah, no, I think that's a good question. Any more questions, members? Mm -hmm. um, Council McElroy isn't here tonight, so I would obviously he would have probably would have yeah, made wanted to comment on some of that, and also to move it. But I, as I'm the chair, I'm going to move this. Uh, we, we adopt this charter. Have well, I got a seconder? Councillor Smith. Okay. Yes, so I'm, I'm just like to say, moving it. I'm, I'm delighted to say we're signing up to this. I mean, I think. You said sustainability is one of our one of our key priorities um, over, the, over, over, over the last um, over, over the last year. And we're starting to see the fruits of that through in some of the reports we're getting, and also some of the um, some of the same best to save projects that we're having to bring on stream. And I think um, therein lies therein lies future savings for the authority, but also to absolutely to do the right thing. So I'm really glad to see this, to see this work, as I say, Councillor McElroy, certainly can't be here tonight, I'm sure he would have spoken to that effect, but I'm, I'm happy to move this. Any, any, any other member, member wish to, 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 to speak? Well, does the second wish to speak? The second wish to speak. Uh, well, I'm only going to say I think it's an excellent uh, initiative, but what it, I don't think the report says how many of the other fire authorities or fire games signed up to it. An interesting piece of information, mm. but climate change involves all of us in every asset, of, every aspect of our lives. So an organisation like this to adopt this charter would be an excellent mm. idea. I can't see any reason not to do so. Oh, thank, thank, Councillor Councillor Dunlop. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I agree. On, on the face of it, it looks like a, a great charter to sign up to. Um, I just wanted to, you know, raise a warning mm. that um, whilst you know, we should all look to be more sustainable, um, green, uh, reduce energy, reduce our carbon footprint <coughs> wherever we can. Um, I'm sure our budget lead member would keep a close eye on the fact that it's not costing our residents additional funds to do so over and above, you know, these excellent invest to save uh, projects that we've already put in this year's budget. Um, but I, you know, I'm always a little bit suspicious about people that saying, you know, this, this this will reduce our carbon footprint and it will do this. Uh, and it ends up costing the residents of all Berkshire money to do it. Okay. That's fine. I think, Chairman, since um, it comes, but not referred to, um, 
they don't have to be mutually exclusive. I think you can find ways of uh, improving your environment, uh, reducing your carbon footprint, delivering social value, providing it is within an affordable value for money envelope. And I think that's the sort of parameters we would bring to our decision making because it makes sense. Yeah. One doesn't lead the other. If you get it right, they're in tune. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other ones? Thank you, members. I, mean, I thought excellent questions and an, in, an interesting debate. And I think, well, obviously, we're going to return to as, as we progress um, with, 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 this, with this work. But thank you, Andy, as well, for, for, for the report. So, all those in favour of us adopting this, all those fine. Chair, I think it was subject to my comment about 7.1. I'm happy yeah, to. Yeah, yes, we, 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 we noted those. I think it could good for it. It's like changing our work. Okay, I think there's nothing. Anybody against? Extensions? No. Okay, you can carry on. Thank you. Okay, so agenda item 15 is the Build Environment Programme Closed Down Report. It's interesting. Title is New Shirt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, the Built Environment Programme was set up in 2020 <coughs> to assess and assure against the 46 recommendations in the Grenfell Tower Inquiry Phase 1 report. And we've come to a close in January 2023. Our aim was to complete objectives one and two first, which were the 46 recommendations, and provide an assurance that our targeted high risk buildings were audited and compliant. I feel confident that we are leaving the organisation in a really good position in regards to these. However, there are a small number that were beyond our control and needed significant organisational and or sector-wide change, which will continue to be worked on and be monitored within the service. An independent review of the programme was undertaken in December of last year as part of the service's approved internal audit plan. The objective <coughs> of the review was to allow management to have assurance that actions have been developed and been progressed to address the gaps identified against the recommendations. The review has confirmed the authority can take substantial assurance that the controls upon which the organisation relies to manage this risk are suitably designed, constantly, consistently applied and effective. This is a really positive outcome and I understand the full report will be at the next ordinate governance meeting for you to see in more detail. The programme was also interviewed during the recent HMI inspection and the following areas of work from the BEP were mentioned within the report. The crews and protection staff complete joint visits to improve staff awareness of building construction and safety measures. Services web pages hold information about compliance and fire safety, which staff can direct responsible persons and builder owners to via QR code. And the introduction of electronic quick reference sheet was well received by staff. So again, it was really good to see the work of the BEP being picked up throughout the inspection. As part of our own programme evaluation, we have carried out our own staff surveys and crew engagement sessions to understand how the changes implemented have affected individuals and their roles. 91.3% of staff who responded to the question stated they feel more confident to respond to incidents in HR up in high-rise residential buildings. 92% 92.6% of staff who responded to the question stated they, they feel co more confident in conducting familiarisation visits following our training. And 86.4% found our assurance exercises useful. So I just thought it was a good opportunity to share some of the positive feedback we've received in regards to the work that the BEP has done and the changes that we've made. So this is the last update from the BEP. So I will take any questions. Any questions? Councillor Bates. Uh, I would just like to know um, what the situation is, especially with the cladding on our outsides of buildings. Who is going to pay for that? Because I've heard in the news many times that they haven't decided who is going to pay for it, whether it's the government or whether it's going to be um, the, 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 the people that actually own the uh, apartments. There's 
Great. This is probably probably one for for me. So, um, as you uh, correctly state, the um, external cladding um, still there are a number of buildings uh, where that needs to be remediated. The the buildings where the legislation uh, would come into play would be a high rise residential building that's seven stories and above, or eighteen metres and over. <coughs> Recently, the government has indicated to developers um, that they need to uh, put in place plans to remediate uh, any uh, cladding that's found to be um, outside of the regulations uh, and indicated that failure to do so would uh, come with sanctions. Um, uh, for example, uh, developers seeking further uh, permission to uh, build uh, would not be considered for that. So it still is um, something which needs to be um, bottomed out by the responsible person um, to, to identify how to uh, remediate the cladding. And there still um, is some question mark with regard to who um, will be responsible for paying for it. But we are moving towards a, a, a more clearly defined uh, situation with, with the latest government position. Any, any more questions? No. We're going to ask to note this report, and I think we need to be obviously we're all aware of the incredible amount of work that has gone in since the Grenfell Tower tragedy. Um, there's a very large number of high rise buildings in the county, particularly in, in, in Reading and Slough areas, and they've all had to be inspected. And there's a very extensive list of recommendations as well that we've we've had to uh, we've had to meet so I'd like to thank the team for their work. Councillor Linden, you, you want Yeah, to... I'm just really impressed with that, how the raw park has been this this done work. You know, it's taken a lot of resources and I'd like to echo the view chair on that. And also the robustness of the Secretary of State, Michael Gove, in you know, trying to be fair certainly to rather horrendous cases of uh, residents being forced to fund the work, which they just, that it's not their fault. I just want to raise that point. <coughs> well, indeed, it's Councillor Bateson, you, 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 you asked a question on that, and I think you may have said. Yes, I just, want to <coughs> say, I just wanted to say about the 187 high-rise uh, um, buildings, um, and I think it's absolutely fantastic that, that we've been through them all. I mean, that's quite something... No. Yeah, it's it's a, yeah no, I can, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, I mean, this is a so it's a closed down port, but obviously the work will continue, and there will be further recommendations and ground for. So this is a work in progress. But members were asked to note the report. Sorry, um, Councillor Mark, Council, Mark, Council, Mark, Council, Mark, Council. Um, Mr. Councillor Smith, right? Yeah, it's a great piece of work, and, and it's great that you've gone beyond just the part oh. recommendations to look at the other aspects. But what I was interested, or keen to understand, as as Councillor Gittins has just referred to, is your four high rise going up in red. Are your officers uh, becoming more involved with the building construction aspects before we even get there? As I say, we have, we have dumb questions, but I think, you know, in the spirit of the meeting, what, what, what work is carrying on in, in, in regards to the new build? What's the, what's the situation? I think members will be interested. Trick again. Yes, so um, there is, a, a, as uh, members will be aware, there is a, a new building safety regulator uh, that is uh, being set up, has been set up uh, in part um, under the uh, governance of the Health and Safety Executive. Um, and that brings in a far more, uh, a far stricter uh, regulatory regime, regime with regards to uh, both the, the planning, the building, and then the occupation of a, a residential high-rise building or any high-risk building of that nature. Um, so the scrutiny will be far greater. <coughs> the, the responsible person will be required to make a safety case for the premises uh, before it can proceed. Um, so a much higher level of scrutiny uh, is now in place. Well, I love that question, so you do some extra work on your final meeting, Trubal. Well, Thank you. Answer, answer, answering the questions. But look, this is an important piece of work that's, that's ongoing. Um, and we will obviously have reports back to the authority um, to, to, to that effect. But we are just being asked to note the reports. Isn't it? So are so members happy to note? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, sir. <coughs> so, item 16 is the industrial 
action update, which is <laughs> hopefully has a slightly cheerier note to it than it might have done. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm going to give a very brief uh, update. Uh, I think most of the elements have either been covered in terms of the chair's uh, announcements or indeed the uh, budget uh, presentation <laughs> earlier. Um, I was intending, well, I have considered bringing a, a, a paper through depending on the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Uh, and I think uh, it's, I'm quite pleased, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, to be able to give a very brief overview in terms of uh, the current uh, pay dispute situation. Uh, so as was uh, discussed previously, uh, the likelihood, I suppose, of, this, of the potential for industrial action has significantly reduced uh, as a result of an improved uh, offer of the uh, employers uh, to the FBU. Um, the FBU uh, Executive Council that has agreed to put that offer to its members, and, and I think the point, the very important point to note, uh, is that they have unanimously uh, agreed to recommend that offer. Uh, so that's uh, that is positive. Um, in terms of the actual ballot, uh, that will open on the 20th of February uh, and then subsequently close on the 6th of March. So we won't know for sure uh, until uh, the 6th of March or very soon after that date. Um, so whilst there isn't a guarantee, uh, the service has already started to scale back its, its proprietary work in regard to IA uh, and then redeploy some of those resources back into... Uh, frankly, areas that we uh, may have needed to pause or slow down uh, as we'd work towards uh, the kind of heightened threat of industrial action. Uh, so uh, that is probably uh, all I have to say on the matter, but I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Any questions for Mark? No. And obviously, if the situation turns the opposite of what we're talking about, members will be briefed and we'll, 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 I, I think we, we can... Hopefully, with fingers crossed, say that we appear to have averted immediate threat of industrial common action. Prevails. And common sense does prevail, you're right, Councillor, Councillor Dudley, and a, and a good offer for our firefighters. Okay, right. Thank you very much, Mark. We move on to item um, 17, the forward plan. Does anybody wish us to noting? Um, any comments on the, on the forward plan? No? So... We're happy to note the forward plan. Right, and then we have the minutes of the standing committees. We'll note them. Uh, Does anybody happen to note the minutes of the standing committees? Uh, the date of the next meeting is the 26th of this full fire authority. Obviously, we've got meetings in between of other, um, of other, of other meetings. The date of the next fire authority is the 27th of April here at Bridge uh, Q. And at this point, we do on the, on the agenda have the exclusion of the public and the press. Seconded. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Just wait for the cameras to fire off and then we'll. Take a vote. <coughs> <coughs>